in all things communications for the state. Um, and this topic is, if anyone's logged in, you probably want to mute your mic and turn off your speaker. We'll get some feedback in the room. Um, this topic for me is uh, certainly very personal. My uh, wife is a marriage and family therapist. She's working on getting her hours right now. She's about, I think, 600 hours away from her license. So I've been involved in this topic for quite a while. I'm really excited to be part of this group. So with that, uh, we're going to get into the agenda. Um, let me activate the clicker here and okay. make sure that that's working. So the first thing we're going to do is go over some logistics. So just some basic logistics before we go over the rules. Your mic has a little button that says push. When you push it, it'll turn green, and then everyone will be able to hear you. So that's that, that'll be a good thing. Um, and then after each agenda item, what we will do is we'll go through a process where um, we brief out the agenda item, then we ask for comments from the board and comments from the public. And that'll be kind of the rhythm that we go through through the agenda. And this first meeting is really focused on setting up the board for success, outlining kind of what the board's about. And one of the key things to understand is the rules around how these boards work. So we've invited Meg Wilson from our Cal OES Legal to give us an overview of Bagley Keen. So if you want to switch that presentation over, I'd appreciate that. And Meg, I'll turn it over to you. Good morning. Oh. Okay, thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name's Meg Wilson, as Budge said, and I'm a senior counsel for Cal OES, and I'll also be acting as 988 Technical Advisory Board Counsel. Uh, since this is the first meeting of the 988 Technical Advisory Board, as Budge mentioned, um, we would like to go over some of the basics of the Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act, which governs these types of board meetings. Um, so for some of you, this may be review. I know I recognize some faces from our 911 advisory board. And then for others of you, um, this may be new. Just to get a show of hands, and I know folks online, um, maybe you can, I don't know if they have like the raise hand feature. Um, how many of you have, of our board members have sat on other state boards and commissions? Okay. So I see about four hands in the room. I don't know if we got any on... Um, in the, the chat or the raise hand feature online. Okay, so about four of you. Okay, just wanted to, to see. Um, so Bagley Keene is a quite, it's a quite lengthy and nuanced law, but so we're just gonna go over the very high level basics. Okay, so what is the Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act? So this is the law that governs public meetings conducted by state agencies. And I see we have some folks from locals. This law parallels the Brown Act, um, which the counties and the cities use to govern their meetings. So it's very similar. It's set forth in government code sections 11120 to 111321. Um, it covers all state boards and commissions. Uh, the purpose is transparency in government, so that's similar to our Public Records Act, and it generally requires these bodies to publicly notice their meetings, prepare agendas, accept public comment, and conduct meetings in public unless specifically authorized in the Act uh, to operate under closed session, which we will go over. Okay, Bagley Keen overview. So these are all the topics we're gonna go over. What is a meeting? Types of communications of board members, committees and task force, notice for meetings, distribution of information, location and access of our meetings, teleconferencing, which is a big topic since COVID, public comment, voting, and lastly, closed session. Oh, sorry, not lastly, violations of the of the Bagley key. And I don't know if we can see that on our screen. Okay, so starting at the very, very basics, what is a meeting? So a meeting is a congregation of a majority of the members of the board, which we have here today, to hear, discuss, debate, or deliberate on topics that are within the subject matter jurisdiction of the board. So obviously um, a meeting where you're debating or discussing agenda items would be covered, but also a meeting includes when you receive information. So I know like on the 911 advisory board, sometimes we've received letters 
um, from the public. So those have to be discussed also in open session. Okay, now next to types of communications from our board members. So we will see on the board, so sometimes there's a clarification of an issue. Okay. Um, and then sometimes it'll be a facilitation of an agreement or compromise. And then sometimes we will have a conversation that advances the resolution of an issue. And then any aspect of the deliberative process. So I wanna go over serial meetings um, because this is a very important for uh, board members. So what is a serial meeting? A serial meeting is a private meeting um, by which a majority of the members of a legislative body commit to a decision, discuss or engage in collective deliberation concerning public business. So this is when board members outside of open session discuss a topic that is relevant or an agenda item to the technical board. So we don't wanna be doing that because again, in the interest of transparency, which is the purpose of this law, we want folks to be doing that in open session and not privately. So serial meetings are strictly prohibited under the Bagley Keene. And I will say that it, serial meeting is technically the majority of members, which here we have 12 members. So it's gonna be a little difficult for majority of members because um, it would constitute seven of you. But um, I just want to be clear that telephone conversations or emails count. So um, sometimes we'll have folks, I'm going to go down, hit the reply all button. So you'll receive information sometimes from counsel, someone like me or Budge or Paul, and just be aware not hitting the reply all um, if information is sent to board members, because that could constitute a serial meeting. Um, so make sure when you hit reply, you just direct that to the person who sent the email. Um, so a serial communication could include directly or through inter intermediaries. So sometimes you may have an employee reach out or a secretary or assistant. So that would all count as a serial meeting, even if it's not you directly. And then that includes any item that could be the subject matter of the board. So social gatherings, just beware conferences, retreats, or gatherings attended by a majority of the members. Um, so I know you folks are all throughout California, but sometimes since you're all in the same industry, you could run into each other at conferences or social gathering. And so just beware not to be discussing um, agenda items or topics that are within the board's jurisdiction. So committees and task force. Sometimes the board may create a smaller group of board members to hold a committee or task force on um, an individual topic or issue. And I don't, do we have any committees on the 911 advisory board? That's right. Okay, that's right. Yeah, so it has to constitute three or more persons. Does anyone know why it has to be three or more persons? So that's so that you can get a majority. So if you had just one person or two person, there's no majority. But if this committee is voting, you want three or more so that you got you have a two or more majority. Um, so a committee or task force has to be created by formal action of the board or um, any member of the board. And then these committees and task force are also subject to the act. So you would also have to um, hold an, an open session meeting when you're discussing and have agenda items. So I just wanted to make that clear. Okay, really briefly, so notice for meetings. So for these type of meetings under Bagley Keene, you have to give 10 calendar days notice in advance. So that's to the public and to board members. The agenda must be distributed 10 calendar days in advance. This includes description of specific items to be discussed for both open and closed session. And then I did a little asterisk for closed session because you have to list the statutory authority. So the code section under which you're holding closed session. So again, that's in the interest of transparency. Um, you want the public to know why you're meeting in closed session. Okay, distribution of information. 
So written materials provided to the majority of the board must be available to the public unless otherwise exempt from disclosure under the Public Records Act. So anything that would be included in the agenda packet that's provided to the board members, we also want to distribute and make sure that that is public as well. Um, so that's usually the whole packet is posted on the internet when we advertise board meetings. So no communication of the board on material distributed prior to the meeting. So even when you get a packet, we don't want board members discussing anything in that packet privately. We want that to be discussed in public during open session. And again, that all goes towards our goal of transparency. Location and access. So we want a public location and we want to keep in mind when we consider teleconferencing or video conferencing. So today we're here at uh, Sequoia Pacific so this is a public location. Members of the public are able to attend um, and they also should have access via the web. So if we do allow teleconferencing and tele, tele or video, video conferencing, then we will post that Zoom link on our agenda item so the public has the opportunity to chime in that way. All meetings, notices, and materials must be accessible under the ADA. That is required under the Bagley Keen. Okay, teleconferencing. So this became a big topic um, once COVID hit. Obviously, all meetings went to the teleconferencing um, medium, and the governor waived via an executive order a lot of the requirements in Bagley Keen that require you to hold meetings in public. Now, as you can see, we're back in person, which is lovely, um, but there's still some waivers that are allowing uh, some board members to still appear via um, teleconferencing and allowing members to uh, voice their opinions that way, which uh, I think most people liked <laughs> having that option, especially we're here on this board, we have people coming from all over the state. Um, so it is permitted, each site must be accessible to the public, may have additional observation locations. So that is temporarily waived. So it used to be, or it is under the Bagley Keen that each individual, so sometimes individuals are appearing at their public workspace, other times individuals might be tuning in from home. So there was a requirement, is a requirement that you have to make your, um, where you're coming from available to the public and obviously someone's home, you're not gonna do that. So that's temporarily waived right now. Um, we'll see where that goes. All proceedings have to be audible. And then when you're doing teleconferencing, you have to do a vote by roll call because um, you can't see the folks in person. So you have to make sure that we can get everyone's vote. And then all other provisions of Bagley Keen still, still apply even though you're doing the teleconferencing, except those that were still waived, as I mentioned, making your, your home a public space. They're not requiring that right now. So public comment, very important. We want the public to be able to voice their um, opinions, observations, complaints. Um, we want them to be able to make those comments. So it must be allowed on any agenda item before a vote. So you'll see Budge before we vote on any, or not we, but before the board votes on any agenda item, he will ask for if there's any public comment um, because the public has a right to voice their comments before the board takes an official vote on anything. Um, the one exception is that the subject matter is appropriate for closed session. Um, obviously, you won't have the public commenting on that, but there is an obligation that you report out after that closed session anything that should be made public. May permit, so under Bagley Keene, you can permit public testimony on any items not on the agenda, so the public has a right to just address the board on anything, even if it's not agendized. Uh, the board may not deliberate on the matter, but you can place it on a future agenda or direct a staff person to look into that matter. So the reason they do that is because if a, a member of the public brings up a new topic that wasn't agendized, um, we don't want the board addressing it because somebody may have looked at the agenda and chose not to attend the meeting based on the list. And so we don't want to be bringing up new topics and discussing them when somebody may have not chose to attend this meeting because they didn't know that topic was going to be discussed if that makes sense. Okay, voting. So must be done in public, no secret ballots, no voting by proxy. 
pretty straightforward and has to be by a majority vote of the state body. Closed session. So this is the one I said we would talk about. So agenda items allow for closed session in very limited circumstances. So there's a set of exceptions listed in Bagley Keene as to when a board can go into closed session and discuss a topic outside of the, the view of the public. So here's some examples and they're very limited. So you can go in closed session to discuss and vote on specific employee personnel matters. Obviously that may be something we don't want in public if you're going to discuss um, somebody's employment. So pending or potential litigation, so obviously a lawsuit that may be pending that's relevant to the board or something that could lead to litigation. Um, appointment, employment or dismissal of an executive officer. Again, that's a personnel matter. Um, audit reports can be discussed in closed session. And then there is this exception for a security threat of criminal or terrorist activities. But before you meet in closed session, um, this one's a little different. You actually have to have a two third vote of the board. Um, that agrees to meet in closed session before you go. Okay, so what happens if you violate the Bagley Keene Act? So it could get referred to the AG's office, a district attorney, or any interested person may bring an action if they feel that Bagley Keene has been violated. So what are the consequences? The potential consequences if they discover that you may have violated Bagley Keene is that the decision of the body may be overturned. So if they find that you gave improper notice um, or otherwise it violated the act, any decision that the board made during that meeting could potentially be overturned, which obviously would be very problematic. There could be misdemeanor penalties. So this, I will say, um, you don't see as often. It's usually not when there was like an accident. There was willful um, conduct to violate Bagley Keene and withhold something from the public. And then Bagley Keene also has may award attorney's fees and costs. So this is, again, um, similar to the Public Records Act. They want to keep the state bodies honest. Um, and so if somebody is bringing a suit for a violation and they find a violation did occur, the person who brought the lawsuit could be entitled to attorney's fees and costs. And last but not least, this is a little disclaimer <laughs> we like to put in that this presentation did not offer any legal advice, even though I'm an attorney. Um, always consult your individual legal counsel or your state agency regarding liability and risks. And then that's my name and contact information. So did I have any questions? I know this was just very basic, very high level. Sorry, I had my back turned to you folks. <laughs> okay, I'm not seeing any questions, so I'm going to turn it back over to Budge. Thank you, Meg. Um, so with that, um, you may be wondering, well, if, with all these rules, how did you come up with today's agenda? Because we didn't have a board, and so how could we come up with an agenda? Well, that was a subject of great debate, trust me, uh, as we formed this board. And so we really came up with this agenda just really to introduce the board to the structure of the board, the requirements under the statute, and that's how we came up with the agenda. But next board, you'll see there's an agenda item where each of you can give us information to put on the next agenda. So be thinking about that as we work through this morning, uh, because we will be polling you at the end to see if you have anything for future meetings. So any other questions on agenda item number two from the board? All right. Any questions online or from the public with agenda item number two? All right. Seeing and hearing none, we'll move on to agenda item number three, which is the swearing in and presentation of board members. So uh, we have uh, Chief, uh, we have uh, Deputy Director Marv Green here. He's going to be leading us in an oath, and then after we do that, uh, we'll we'll actually take formal roll call uh, of each of the members and give you a chance to introduce yourself. So, Marv, I'm going to turn it over to you because um, technically I'm not even the chair yet until you go through this exercise. So, thank All you, right. sir. All right, thank you, everybody. Um, on behalf of the Governor's Office of Emergency Services and the Director, uh, Mark Gerdelucci, I want to thank you for agreeing to be on this board and, uh, and, and helping out in, in what is a very worthwhile endeavor for the state of California. 
and we hope that you uh, you find your time on the board very rewarding. I'm sure it will be. If you could all rise if possible, and if you're able to uh, raise your right hand, I'm going to read the oath and uh, just repeat after me. Thank you. I state your name. I do solemnly swear, do solemnly swear that, I will support and defend that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California. The Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of California. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. To the Constitution of the United States. To the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. That I take this obligation freely. That I take this obligation freely. Without any mental reservation. Without any mental reservation. Or purpose of evasion, or purpose of evasion, and that I will well and faithfully, and I will well and faithfully discharge the duties, discharge the duties upon which I am about to enter. Upon which I am about to enter. Thank you. You may seat, be seated. Uh, uh, congratulations. You are now all members of the board, Mr. Chairman. Do you have any members of the board that were not able to take the oath today? No, we there are two. There are two uh, members online that, that are three members online that also took the oath. Awesome. Thank so you very they much. were all present. All right. Thank you, sir. Okay. So um, continuing on with item number three, uh, we'll, we'll go around for a, a formal roll call. And I thought it would be good given the diverse group that we have, the number of experts and leaders in this community that we're bringing together um, if you could introduce yourself when I call your name and maybe give uh, something brief about your organization as I go through the list. So we'll start out with Assistant, Assistant Secretary Stephanie Welch. Yeah, and please remember your mic button. Uh, good morning. My name is Stephanie Welch. I'm the Deputy Secretary of Behavioral Health for the Health and Human Services Agency. Um, in that role, I serve as the primary behavioral health policy advisor to Secretary Ghali on behavioral health policy issues. Um, and also I have been designated to be our state lead representing our Health and Human Services Department for the implementation of 988. Um, so I'm very excited to be here. Um, I am a social worker by training, so I will probably be the least technically knowledgeable person amongst this group, but I will learn a tremendous amount that will help us fulfill our responsibilities and obligations, um, particularly in implementing AB 988 around the policy issues. So thanks, for, thanks and I'm happy to be here. Thank you. All right, next we'll go to uh, Dr. Matthew Goldman. I believe you're online. If you could unmute yourself, sir, and, and introduce yourself. Yes, hi everybody. I'm sorry I can't be there in person today, but really glad to be joining this group. Um, my name is Matthew Goldman. I am the medical director for crisis services for the San Francisco Department of Public Health Behavioral Health Services. Um, I'm a psychiatrist by training. I have a direct clinical oversight over a crisis call line and mobile crisis. Um, I hold the contract for our local 988 provider, San Francisco Suicide Prevention, um, as the sort of county system of care contract manager. And I also have been working closely with our local 911 Department of Emergency Management to embed behavioral health clinicians into our local 911. And so have thought a lot about interoperability um, between our behavioral health crisis services and our local emergency services. So really pleased to join this group. Okay, thank you, sir. All right, next we'll go to Chief Deputy Director Brian. Is it Aiello? Not quite, Aiello. Aiello, yeah, all right. It's, it's like Sorry. I in yellow, so that's how you can yeah. <laughs> So uh, yeah, uh, my name is Brian Aiello. I'm the Chief Deputy Director for the California Emergency Medical Services Authority. Uh, by training, I'm a paramedic. I've been a field provider uh, in this state for about 20 years and uh, moved into agency uh, regulation about 2015. So. Uh, this is my most recent post, and uh, as far as our organization goes, the California Emergency Medical Services Authority, along with our local emergency medical services agencies around the state, oversees uh, the provision and regulation of EMS um, kind of statewide. We want to make sure we have quality controls and make sure that uh, we oversee the licensure and certification of EMS personnel. So um, we... Uh, 
actually, as far as uh, this group is concerned, uh, I've the, been designated the 988 lead along with our EMSA medical director, Dr. Hernando Garzon. Um, so you might be seeing him at some point. Um, and uh, yeah, we just want to, uh, we, we think that this uh, process of bringing behavioral health and, and really addressing this statewide is, is very important. Um, as far as uh, 911 calls go, um, behavioral health has been part of our book of business for a long time, and I think that uh, addressing this on a state level um, is, is really going to be great for all of our citizens and residents. So thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Next, we'll go to Director Lizanne Wick. I, I think you're online. If you want to yep. come off mute and introduce yourself, please. Hi, Al. Um, I'm Lizanne Wick. I'm the director of the local uh, suicide prevention crisis center here in Sacramento at Wellspace Health. Um, I've been here 18 years in suicide prevention and um, really involved in the 988 planning and uh, implementation and really thrilled to be a part of this board. Looking forward to it. All right, thank you. Next we'll go to Erica Aragon from D. Hirsch. Good morning, everyone. My name is Erica Aragon. I am the IT project manager for D.D. Hirsch Mental Health Services. We are the 988 Center for the Los Angeles area, and our organization won the state contract uh, collaborating with Health and Human Services to help organize all 13 statewide centers to provide a consistent 988 experience for our Californians. I'm extremely excited to sit on this board. I was a volunteer crisis counselor in 2014, and it's very exciting to see technology support this very important endeavor. All right, thank you. Uh, Dr. Edwin Poon. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Edwin Poon. I am the Deputy Director of Managed Care with the Behavioral Health Services Department uh, at Santa Clara County. So um, I oversee uh, our 988 call center, which is one of the two counties here in the States that runs our own call center. So very excited to be here uh, to collaborate with all of you, uh, to learn from you, but also share with, our, your, with you our experience of managing uh, our 988 call centers. I am a uh, psychologist by training and have been working in managed care for the last uh, probably about 10 years. Uh, really doing administrative work. So really excited to be here and hopefully again to learn and also share my experience with all of you. Thanks. All right. Thank you, sir. All right. Krista Miller. Good morning, everybody. My name is Kristen Miller and I am with Riverside University Health Systems. I'm an administrator for our crisis support system of care department. Um, so I oversee our mobile crisis response teams. We have several different types in Riverside County. I have been, I'm an LCSW, so I'm a social worker as well, and I've um, been a part of crisis services for about 23 years, and I'm very humbled to be part of this advisory board, so thank you. All right, thank you, Kristen. All right, Rosa Ramos. Good morning, everybody. I'm Rosa Ramos, and I'm representing the California chapter of the National Emergency Number Association, NINA. Um, I also bring 20 years of experience as not only someone who wore the actual 911 headset, but also managing and supporting those who wear them. So I'm very excited to be here and work on the collaboration between Human Health Services, EMS Agency, and 911, and Cal OES. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Rosa. All right. Jeff Hebert. Good morning, everyone. Jeff Hebert. Um, I am representing the California Public Safety Radio Association, which is the Southern California chapter of um, the Association of Public Safety Communications Officials, or APCO. Um, I am uh, a communications manager uh, in charge of um, the communications center at the San Diego County Sheriff's Department. I worked for the Sheriff's Department for 27 years. Uh, my entire career uh, spent at the communications center. So uh, much like uh, Rosa, um, a career dispatcher, um, experience in answering um, a countless number of 911 calls, some of them related to mental health. Um, and I'm really looking forward to the opportunity, the, the, the movement that we're, we're going to and, and being able to integrate the newly implemented 988 uh, with 911, um, as I think it will uh, be better for the agencies involved, um, both on the uh, mental health side of things and, and for uh, public safety agencies, law enforcement, fire, and EMS. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Jeff. Tracy Gonzalez. 
Hi, I'm Tracy Gonzalez. I am the uh, dispatch supervisor for the Downey Fire Department representing uh, 911 Fire and EMS. Uh, we're in LA County and we uh, at the 911 level deal with uh, our citizens, our communities on a daily basis in different uh, levels and stages of crisis. And um, it's exciting to be able to have this elevated to the state to be able to also help us in the dispatch center fill those gaps of uh, us being able to help them and and all of us collaborating to be able to find out uh, figure out some good answers to um, um, a long-standing problem um, this is my 33rd year in the business and um, i'm really excited about being a part of this this group all right thank you tracy jennifer kenton Hi, I'm Jennifer Kenton. Um, I'm in my 16th year uh, as a communications supervisor for the Campbell Police Department in Santa Clara County. Um, <clears throat> I'm representing 911 uh, from a local jurisdiction level. I'm part of a conversation in Santa Clara County where we are trying to figure out how to integrate 911 and 988 together. Um, we see the benefit and I really hope being part of this board, I will be able to share perspective of those on the floor and uh, make this a successful integration to support um, all members. All right, thank you. Erin Riley. Hi, my name is Erin Riley. I am a uh, dispatch supervisor, currently assigned as the 911 County Coordinator. I'm from, sorry, Contra Costa County Sheriff's Office. I uh, have been a supervisor there for 26 years. I currently am part of a committee in our county that is working on getting a mobile crisis team working for mental health. Uh, we're trying to integrate all the agencies in our county to agree to one single plan. We have numerous contract cities and individual police departments that all have differing ideas on how to do it. So um, I really am happy to be on this and hoping to get different ideas uh, and use those and vice versa to get all of us on one page. So thank right. you. Thank you, Erin. All right, and Jennifer Dwyer, I believe she's online. If you'll come off mute and introduce yourself, please. Good morning, everybody. Sorry I couldn't be there in person with you guys. I'm actually on a family vacation, but this, this is so important to me. I wanted to be able to join in, so I appreciate being supported virtually. At California Commission on Post, I am the Public Safety Dispatch Program Manager. So Post is responsible for setting those hiring, screening, training standards for dispatchers. I'm really excited and honored to be part of this program because Anything that we decide, we'll be able to help on the post side push out towards for basic training and put together our best practices because I know the field is already anxious to see how this is going to impact them and what we can do to strengthen that relationship with 988. So thank you for having me. All right. Thank you, Jennifer. Okay. So um, this agenda item typically takes about 20 seconds. So at the next meetings, we'll go much quicker through this. But I thought with the diverse backgrounds that each of us are bringing, you can see we've got a really good balance between um, behavior health, mental health, and 911 professionals. And when we go through what this board is charged with, you're going to see we're going to need all that expertise to accomplish what it is that we that we have in front of us. So um, any other comments from the board on agenda item number three? All right, any from the public, any comments online? All right, moving on to agenda item number four, if I remember to advance the slides. So we we wanted our uh, 988 system director to um, present this portion and try as hard as I could. No one in my leadership agreed to appoint anyone else to this position except me. So uh, you're stuck with me given this part of the brief. Um, so I'll be wearing kind of the Cal OES hat on this portion of, of the overview and not so much the chair of this board. So please uh, ask questions and um, interrupt as we go along. I wanted to put the link to the actual legislation in here because what I've put on here is a summary and by no means do I think these are what's most important or if I don't have anything on this summary slide that you think is critical, I was not trying to exclude it. So please go read the statute 
And if you're really, really gung-ho, read the entire thing, including the modifications to the revenue and tax code. Um, that's a, a really good sleeping aid. Uh, but all of that is in this legislation. So you'll get the sort of the history of the bill is there. And then because multiple government codes and revenue and tax codes are, are changed, they're all in one place for you to find those changes. Then what happens is the actual government code or revenue and tax code is updated. So when you go look at that in the, the code search tool that's online, you can actually go see what it looks like when it's written. There's a beginning introduction to the bill, which is technically not law, but informs the law and the code updates that are made. So when you read the top portion, that's sort of like a summary. Critically important, but it's the law that we'll focus in on because that's the code changes. So just kind of keep that differentiation out. And you'll know when you get to that portion in your reading, when it mentions the first government code that's changed, and then that's the actual government code. So just a little background there. Um, obviously, what this law did was establish 988 using the digits 988. And it was very clear that we're in compliance with existing federal laws and standards. So there's a whole bunch of other background uh, linkage that happens with this particular law. Another thing that it did was it established this board. And we wanted to put the bullets right on the slide that come directly from the statute of what this, this board is supposed to do. So it's supposed to do feasibility and planning for sustainable interoperability between 988, 911, and behavioral um, health services, hence the makeup of the board. So if you're wondering how we came up with this group, not only did the statute say we had to have this group, but we were really purposeful in reaching out to those that were experts in this field to kind of guide these discussions and, and come up with this plan. Then in addition to that, we've got to look at the technical and operational standards for 988 system that allow for coordination with the 911 system. So this interaction between 988 and 911, um, certainly from a technology perspective, but there is some certain policy or procedural matters that we will also discuss, which is the next bullet, that standards and protocols for call transfers between 911 and 988 and vice versa. All of those things that most of you are looking around are, are shaking your heads, and I'm sure if you're online, you're probably shaking your head too. These are all topics that have been um, of, of front and center as we're moving through this new 988 implementation. So that's what the board is about. We're required to meet quarterly. The slide deck and um, has the meeting dates as one of the last slides, so you'll have a, a, an advance notice of those. Most of those meetings will probably take place at this location, but there's nothing that prevents us from meeting somewhere else if we decide. So that would be up for the board members to, to let us know. But the requirement is we meet quarterly. And it requires representatives from Health and Human Services, 98 Centers, 911, and Behavioral Health. And if you look at the, the representation of the board, I, I think we've checked that box. So any questions on that slide before I go on? Or any comments from the board? Okay. So in addition to all those things, it requires OES and Health and Human Services to develop a plan for statewide 98, 911, and behavioral health services integration. And that plan is due December 31st, 2023, which is a year away, which is a little terrifying. Um, but that that's what's there, and that's what we've got to do. And it, it require, it there's key terms that are defined in the statute. There's a whole multiple pages of them. So I, I didn't include that on the slide, obviously. And it requires us to validate the transfer between 911 and 988. We know that's been completed, but we would call that completed at the basic level. The way that you transfer today between 911 and 988 is typically via what we call a 10 digit transfer in the 911 world where we know the number, well, the center knows the number of the 988 facility and transfers it in that direction and vice versa. If a call comes into 988 that needs to go to 911 in today's world, it's transferred via a 10 digit transfer. We are gonna talk about on a later agenda item, some of the improvements that are coming in this space, but that's what's there today. 
It requires um, OES to appoint a 988 system director, as I said, try as I may, no one else uh, volunteered for that position, so here I am. We are in the process of, of at the state, we, we call it a, a budget change proposal. We have submitted a process to get authorization to actually hire uh, a staff member to do this, but the budget won't be approved until June, won't go into place until July, and because of HR hiring processes, it'll probably be September of 2023 before this person is named. So until then, you're, you're likely stuck with me. Um, and then we've got to verify interoperability. So interoperability between 911 and 988 is, is a step forward from just simply being able to move the call back and forth. We're actually talking about exchanging data and information between 911 and 988 using technology. And that's a lot of what this board is gonna focus on, on discussing. And then we've got to consult with the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, and we have some good relationships in place with them already. So any questions on that slide? Because this one's probably the bulk of our work. All right. Um, continuing on with, with that agenda item, um, it also requires um, Health and Human Services to develop recommendations and a five-year implementation plan for a comprehensive 988 system. Um, so that's something that I think, Stephanie, you're going to be leading the effort on, um, and we'll certainly be uh, working with you on that. And then there is an advisory group that Health and Human Services is forming, and that's going to advise them on that, that plan. And that board will meet quarterly until January 2024. Um, could go longer, but it's certainly required to meet until then. And so there also are about 14 different areas in the, in the statute that this plan needs to address, and it requires um, an annual report to be given to the legislature beginning in December of 2024. And then it amends the health and safety code. And then finally, it amends the revenue and tax code to establish a 988 surcharge. And it sets that surcharge at eight cents for calendar year 2023 and 2024. And then subsequent years, there's a process. I've got a slide on that later because I assumed many of you would have questions about what that involves. So we'll talk through that in a minute, but that's kind of a high level summary. And I don't know, Steph, if you want to add to this slide, because most of this is over in your group, but any anyone have any comments or questions on this items? This is the, the last item on the summary of AB 988. Um, Budge, I would just add that in the governor's signature of AB 988, there was a, men a mention uh, and a direction for CalHSS to do some technical cleanup on the bill. Um, and so that has been our focus this fall. Um, and we look forward to launching into some of these activities in the new year. But um, yeah, that has been our focus um, so far. Okay, thank you. Any other comments from the board on agenda item number four? Okay, any questions or comments online or from the public? All right, the next agenda item, um, to be honest, um, we, put, we put this in here kind of as a placeholder. What we typically do, and we can remove this. So if the board decides you want to remove this, we can certainly do that. Um, you can make a recommendation later. But what we typically do is we have a Cal OES legislative affairs, uh, an external affairs person, come in and brief us on legislation that's in process that's related to this space. Um, we don't really have anything to report today. This was mainly just to get you all to, to see if this is something you wanted. And then at the next board, um, our, you know, the legislature is not in session right now, so there's no current legislation that's introduced. And then at the federal level, we're in what they call that, that lame duck section, session between when the, 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 the current Congress is on its way out and the new Congress is on its way in. So there's no new legislation at the federal level either. Um, so there's really no, you know, critical updates we'd talk about, but um, does everybody um, feel that they want to keep this um, item in place on the agenda? Okay, so everyone in the room is saying yes, but I think since I have remotes, so I have to do a roll call. Okay, so I'm going to have to do a roll call vote, so now you're going to see how this works. It's a lot of fun. Um, okay, so uh, Stephanie, and all you have to say is just yes or no. <laughs> yes. All right. Uh, Dr. Goldman? 
Yes. All right. Uh, Deputy Director Aiello? Yes. All right. Director Wick? Yes. Erica Argon? Yes. Edwin Poon? Uh, yes. Kristen Miller? Yes. Rosa Ramos? Yes. Jeff Faber? Yes. Tracy Gonzalez? Yes. Jennifer Kenton? Yes. Aaron Riley? Yes. Jennifer Dwyer? Yes. All right, so that is unanimous. The motion carries. We will keep that agenda item in and we will let, make sure the next time we have a full brief for you on that. All right, um, any other uh, comments from the public on that one? I probably should have done that before we voted. I'm surprised you didn't come after me. Um, okay, wasn't very controversial, so I think we're okay. All right, um, moving on to agenda item number six. So this, is, this agenda item, again, subject to change is a report. So this body is helping to inform Cal OES of the work that they're trying to do to, to support 911 and 988 and everything that we're talking about. So we tried to come up with kind of a format, a standard brief that we would ask Cal OES to give to the board on these projects to get your input moving forward. We tried to kind of separate it out into major areas that, that we think long-term are probably gonna be a focus of discussion for this board. So 98 projects, um, I'll, I'll go into what a fiscal and operational review is. Um, the status of our call handling system and our customer relationship management software deployment, um, which is gonna be deployed at the 13 centers. The 911 to 988 um, inter interface, the surcharge that is used to fund these efforts, and then any statewide contracts that are, you know, upcoming or needed to support the effort. So that's kind of the, the briefing overview. And what we'll do on each of these items is we'll just kind of move through each one. Um, as far as projects, I don't really have any to report on other than, yay, we started the board and yes, we're moving through this process. But if you can identify initiatives that you would like either a working group to be formed off of this committee to take a look at or for Cal OES to take a look at as they're moving forward. You know, that would be something when we ask for agenda items for next meeting, let us know, we'll put those in here. The next one is, is a fiscal and operational review. This came out of the work that we do. Um, Cal OES now maintains the 911 system for California. There are 438 public safety answering points that we interact with around the state. For them, we do what we call a fiscal and operational review. We literally look at you know, the funding that comes in through the surcharge and then take a look at operational considerations, questions, interaction that need to happen between those centers and OES as we're trying to manage the technology. So this list is what we intend to do when we go out and meet with these 13 centers. Now, as Erica shared, you know, Didi Hirsch has taken the lead role in this over the past year. Um, they've, they've really done a great job of outreach to those centers. And we're just trying to move that process forward and then establish it beyond the time that they're under contract to do that now. So we have a more formal process in place. That's kind of the idea here. And what we hope to accomplish in these is listed on this slide. So we wanna make sure that any technology selected meets the operational needs of the 13 um, lifeline crisis centers that are in California today. We wanna make sure that the interface is developed between 911 and 988 meet the operational needs locally. There's been a lot of data that's gathered. We wanna validate that data and then also get additional feedback as, as we're out there to continue to inform the record on, on what we have in terms of data. There's probably gonna be a lot of questions that these centers have on 988 funding, 988 technology, and then we wanna get really a regular process of interaction between us and these 988 Lifeline Crisis Centers. Um, in the room is Kurt Gallat, if you wanna raise your hand. Um, those online, you'll have to like look to the side of the camera there. But he is uh, one of the key folks at OES that's gonna be leading this interaction. 
And then also we have um, another uh, representative on our team, Anita, who will be working closely with, um, with Kurt to make sure that that interaction happens. So if they reach out to you, that's why they're doing it. They're trying to accomplish these things on this slide. So I wanna see if there's any comments or questions from the board on this, or if you think there's something else we should add to the list as we go out and, and do these interactions. So go ahead, Erica. So I haven't heard yet. Uh, we have the mobile crisis uh, response teams on this board. Is there a written plan for when we're gonna start including how we're gonna involve them and their interface? So we've been a little silent on that in the slides. It's very astute of you to recognize that because part of that work is going to be dependent on the policy that HHS does. And we didn't want to overstep our bounds, but we're, if, if the board wants us to, we can start to ask those questions. So Stephanie, I don't know if you want to comment further on that either, but um, we can add that to this list if you want to talk us to start gathering information and needs related to mobile crisis. We can certainly do that. And part of the design of Cal OES, uh, I'm sorry, Cal OES, uh, uh, of my agency on this board is to make those connections between the two responsibilities of the our responsibility to develop the five-year implementation plan with the advisory body in coordination with this. And I, I just think of this entire project, um, this significant, significant change as a long-term process. And um, I hope that everybody uh, obviously acknowledges how incredibly um, big this is uh, for lack of a, of a more um, specific term, but I think um, uh, this is an area where we have um, some significant amount of work to do because we have such a diverse state and um, we have really different capacities. Um, and we've been doing another project called our crisis care continuum planning project to assess really the capacities that we have on a statewide basis and really more specifically to look at what is the state's role in providing guidance to ensure that there that all Californians have equal access to some basic essential crisis services, including mobile crisis response. So um, it is a big bear to tackle and it, it is essentially the responsibility of the other policy advisory board to tackle that particular issue. Um, and I guess, um, you know, we can think of ways as I'm sitting here um, processing what's being presented, we can think of ways to maybe provide updates in a, in a succinct way so that there's some coordination between these two bodies and Budge and I can kind of strategize on that um, outside of this. Well, I don't know, I'm gonna look at your attorney, um, but uh, but I think we need to, there. yeah, think about <laughs> ways in which maybe it's, a, I mean, maybe it's a future standing agenda item for agency to report on the activities of the advisory body. Um, okay. all right. That might be a, a good way to make sure that we're connecting all of the dots. Okay, thank you. Any other comments on this item? All right, any comments from the public or online that you're seeing? Uh, hi, this is Matt Goldman. Um, I did want to ask, uh, in terms of operational coordination with external folks, for example, SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse Mental Health Service Administration, and other federal partners like the FCC, as we're kind of waiting on the geolocation determination that they're working through, how does that factor into this body's work? Yeah, so um, good question. Uh, this slide here is primarily focused on the interaction between o o Cal OES and the 13 mental health crisis centers in California, the Lifeline Crisis Centers in California. There's a separate process that we're using to also um, do the interaction with the FCC and SAMHSA, but that might be a good agenda item to add as well. So I'll put that as a placeholder. And when we're forming agenda items later, we can talk about that to uh, get a report on the interaction between FCC, SAMHSA, probably Vibrant would be on that list, and there may be others. So be thinking about that in about 10 minutes. We'll, we'll probably get to that point. We'll have a discussion on that. Okay, thank you. A any other comments from the public or from anybody online? Okay, so moving through um, our process, I think. 
It's all right. You guys are just uh, seeing if I can adapt and overcome. I can't. Can you advance the slide? I don't know what's going on. There it is. Um, so for this particular one, um, we we are in the process right now, Cal OES is, of a request for proposals. So that's a, a formal process that we use to solicit a competitive bid to select a technology. There's very specific rules around this process, which some of you are becoming familiar with because we've been interacting with you. But if you want to see the entire um, procurement, you can click on that link. Um, there used to be a search feature, but because we are in the final steps of this process, the search feature is not working right now, but we will make this slide deck available and uh, this hyperlink will take you straight to the procurement. What is in there would be how the bidder is going to respond, all the technical requirements, the statement of work, the cost workbook, all of that is in that link that you see there. We're in our final steps. Um, we're down to uh, determining the final um, vendor that will be awarded this contract. The process will be finished by December, uh, the end of December, and then we'll make an announcement. From there, once the vendor is announced, what this vendor will then do is roll out the technology that will be used to support the 13 lifeline crisis centers around the state. Um, there's a two-year deployment process, and the goal is to have a full deployment uh, by uh, in 2024. So it's an aggressive timeline. We will keep you up to date on that. The first step obviously comes by selecting the vendor, which we will, you know, we will make public as soon as we make that announcement. Um, I did want to provide an overview kind of at a high level of what we're trying to do. And yes, this is a very technical chart. Some of you may have seen it, but um, I'll walk you through kind of all the elements that are in this contract. So if you focus on the two blue boxes that are on the screen, I don't think this, these two over here, I'm, I'm pointing off to this direction. Um, today, nine and eight calls are handled at a central location. Um, they're aggregated by um, uh, Vibrant and sent to California based on the area code of the caller. We could have very long discussions on whether or not that's the right way to do it. Those would be wonderful discussions. The fact is that is the way it's done and we can't change that today. So we will receive those calls and then we will convert them into SIP, which is session initiated protocol. It's an IP protocol. So we can get, get them into a space where we can begin to move them around the state the way that best meets the operational need. And that's indicated by pushing them up into this cloud here. There are a bunch of other calls that come into the mental health crisis centers and the nine and eight lifeline centers. And so all of those call types too, whether they're administrative or hotlines or warm lines or whatever it is you have, all of those would be pushed up into this new platform. In addition, chats and texts that come into Vibrant through their platform, the goal is to work with them to develop an interface to push that into uh, the same location so that you have a single unified platform statewide for calls, chats, and text. There are some requirements we're going to need to work through with Vibrant to achieve that. We are hopeful that that's the case. You'll also see that Crisis Text Line is in here. That is a separate organization. It's um, printed on pretty much every you know ID card of everyone who attends school, uh, university, or, or community college in California, um, and there's services that are available there. The line that we've drawn on this graphic is... Whoop, Sorry, the line that we've drawn on this graphic here is primarily for when those calls are determined to be emergency and need to get to 911. Today, that happens on what we call an administrative line or a 10 digit line, meaning it doesn't come into the 911 center as priority. And during a priority event, 911 calls are answered first, then the administrative lines are addressed. So we want to bring that call in as a 911 call so it gets the appropriate attention. Once everything is up in this platform here, there's the 98 call handling service that's doing voice, chat, and text, and the customer relationship management software is interfacing with other downstream data sources. There's a, a variety of those that are out there. Um, we've got those requirements in the RFP. 
And then there are counselors that log in either at the center or remotely, which you can't see in the room because this little box is in the way, but that says remote on it. And that way they're providing the help needed. At that point, the 98 system is complete, right? Because you've got all the tools and resources and everything at your disposal to handle that, um, the circumstances of whatever that caller needs. Now, if the call is determined that it should go to 911, that's where the next piece comes. We push that call into the 911 system as a 911 call. There's a special protocol we format it into and we deliver it into the 911 system as a 911 call geospatially routed to the right 911 center based on one of three different pieces of data that is potentially available. At a minimum, we know the center it came from. So we can send it to a specific 911 center based on what center it was received at. This will be a rather large conversation to determine who should be the default routed 911 center to get a 988 call. There, there was going to be a lot of work in that area. Some cases, this is going to be easy to solve. In others, there's going to be long conversations. But we have the technology to do it. We'll find the policy on how to get there. Um, the other piece of information that potentially is available is you can push a message this direction so that the caller clicks the link and sends back their location. So essentially, they're giving you permission to know where they are. We can actually route on that exact location. That's in the requirements. Or the counselor can simply ask them, where are you? In which case, that data could be entered into the system and routing could be done on that. So it's going to be one of those three cases, either a default route based on who answered the call, not ideal, but certainly better than just an area code, or push information to the caller, they click a link and return back a location, or the counselor is triaging that call and asking where they are. Multiple ways of transferring this into Dima one are allowed. You can bridge them in and the counselor itself can go with the call, or you can bring in your supervisor as sort of a third party into the conference and, and then they facilitate that transfer. So all of that is spelled out in the technical requirements to get the call into 911. The other direction, we do know the location. So we can simply geospatially route to the right 98 center based on the actual location of the caller. And then it would come into the platform and be routed to the right 98 center. That in what, a minute and a half, two minutes? That's an overview of the technology that's in the contract. So I'm going to pause there to see if there's questions from the board on this. Rosa has a question. Go ahead. A lot to digest, first of all. What? <laughs> But I just, so I'm going to walk it maybe two steps forward and maybe five steps backwards. So I just want to confirm today they're using, um, the 13 centers are using vibrant text. This is a vendor. So the hope is that after this RFP, there will be, it could be vibrant, but it could be another CHS that will process the voice chat and text. Is that what I'm understanding? That's correct. The other question I have is, We've talked about 988 transferring to 911 and 911 transferring to 988 from a voice perspective. What about text? The requirements for text are also in there as well as chat. Chat gets a little dicier because today 911 doesn't do chat. So that's going to be interesting to see how the vendor solves that. But the requirement is in there. So remember, we put requirements as functional requirements, meaning you've got to do this function. We don't necessarily tell them how. Um, some of these requirements that we've put in here um, may take longer to implement than others, but what we're covering here is, is the requirement and where the end state is intended to be. Yeah. Okay. Other questions? Go ahead, Stephanie. I'm going to take us way back. I, I, I understand because Rosa actually just kind of helped answer my question. But I honestly don't know what CHS stands for. Oh, call handling system. I'm sorry. I should okay. have defined that. Yes. That's okay. All right. I know what CRM stands for. Okay. Okay. I will put that acronym on there. And I I hope to spell out all acronyms. So my mistake. Go ahead. The CHS <laughs> I saw in a previous slide. If not, I would have had the same question. But maybe 
we could add a little cheat sheet and all these new acronyms that we're we're hearing. I think in the 911 community, we're very well versed in all the, you know, CPE, but CHS is a new one. Um, so I think maybe we could add that in a in a future slide at some point. Yeah, we can send out an acronym list to the board too. We we've got one and we can send it out. Yeah. Be prepared for like a 20 page document though. So yeah. Okay. Other other questions. Go ahead, Jeff. Um the mental health crisis centers throughout the state that the both the CHS and the CRM is going to be procured for, um, it, is it an option for them to use or are they all on board because of the legislation? Because it, the, the thing that would concern me is that you have a mental health crisis center who decides, eh, I don't like what the state procured. I want our own thing. And I, I think that could lead to interoperability issues. It's, it's part of what we discuss here. So I'm just kind of curious and and um, where that sits on their option, or is it something that they're going to need to, to uh, utilize? There's nothing in statute that compels them to use it. So it's going to be up to us to produce a product that they want to use. And we've put a lot of effort and work into that. So yes, that's a risk. And um, absent some statutory requirement, it's just going to be up to us to demonstrate that the design meets their need. And, and we've really been working really hard on that. But yes, we have that concern as well. That's why Kurt is here. That's his main function in life is to get everyone to love this solution. So they select it. <laughs> I also have another question, Budget. Yeah, go ahead. Um, we're, we're talking specifically about the transfer of uh, calls, uh, both um, voice calls and, and uh, text. Is there any discussion or thought of, or has there been um, any uh, for, for data from like the CRM to the public safety answering point systems, you know, CAD systems, uh, computer aid dispatch systems, those kind of things? Yeah, there is. So during the last round of um, discussions with the vendors, and with the, the Lifeline Crisis Centers, the 13 centers out there, they mentioned that same gap. And so we added a requirement. There's a, a statewide data sharing CAD to CAD project that exists in the 911 space. And we put the requirement in this contract that you've got to be able to, to interface with that system. Now, there's a whole bunch of policy questions that that will then trigger and this board will become involved with, and I'm sure the implementation plan will have to address but we've at least put the technology linkage in place. And I would guess that that would be something that definitely will not be available day one, right. but it's something we can develop to. And then admittedly, our 911 centers will probably be behind. These 13 centers will probably get more advanced technology before every single one of the 438 PSAPs gets technology that can do that same interface. Especially since those PSAPs are using disparate systems and they're kind of- Exactly. But yes, that, that linkage is there and the requirement is there and the technical requirements are there and the statement of work calls it out. So we've at least got those placeholders in there for this solution. Thank you. Yeah. Got a question. <laughs> All right, go ahead. But is there anything tied to the SETNA funding um, to- you know, give them incentive to use the state solution or where yes. it come from? Uh, I'll, I'll cover that later on okay. what setting is and funding. We've got a slide on that. But if they choose to use this solution, Setna through the 98 surcharge pays for it. If they choose to use their own, they're on their own. So that's a pretty good incentive. And it really, to be honest, it, it puts a lot of, um, uh, it puts the onus on on us to get it right, to get the solution right, and and we really want to do that, and we're gonna we're gonna work very hard to achieve that because we want to make it usable. I th I think to Jeff's point, if this system is adopted and installed at all thirteen centers, we can take huge leaps forward from a technology perspective, especially if it meets the operational need, and that's the goal. We've been working really hard on it, and there's a number of um, there's some members of the board that have been helping us through this process as subject matter experts. So we, we appreciate their help in, in helping us achieve that. Okay, go ahead. Um, let me just make sure that I understand as well too. So this platform uh, from the Mental Health Crisis Center perspective, 
would be sufficient for them from an operational perspective, or is there is the expectation that there is their own interface then connect to this? I, I'm trying to. It's the first of those two okay. is the goal. The the challenge, and and this is something that goes back to what Stephanie said. There's a tremendous amount of diversity yeah. and capacity yes. differences around the state, yeah. even just with these 13 centers. Right. So we're learning that there are business models that are in place at these centers that go well beyond 988. And that's going to be the challenge. So we added the requirement in here in, in this, in the technical requirements, that those other services that you may need as a local center that are above and beyond any of these requirements, that frankly would not even be eligible for 988 funding under the law. Yeah those services have to be available and you've got to have a way to get them through this vendor. So we've included that requirement in there, Okay, but it gets a little challenging to satisfy state procurement rules, state funding rules, local needs and all that. But we do have that in there. Okay. So, and I think that's where these fiscal and operational reviews and these discussions we're going to have with the 13 centers is going to become so critical. Thank you for that. I, I'm, yeah. I'm, you know, just tied to the previous uh, comment about the uh, dispatch of crisis mobile dispatch. Uh, certainly, that's one of the areas that we're um, really looking at closely here in Santa Clara County. And uh, with our various different dispatch uh, uh, programs available, so we do wanted to see a platform that's really fully allowed the county to integrate since we do run our own 988 call center. Yeah. So just as an example, but I think the diversity and the complexity of, of the various jurisdictions and, and it will, will be, um, will definitely uh, be an interesting conversation, but um, look forward to it. Thanks. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Any other questions on this item from the board? I have one more. All right, Trace. Um, so is there going to be, or is that we're going to be deciding, I guess, kind of a, um, almost an opt out. So, you know, you've got a, a caller in crisis that's talking to the 988 side already and it's coming our way. And once we can um, identify, geo verify, you know, all these things where they're at or even going our way over to them, um, a lot of them don't want you to know where they're at. And uh, how are we, you know, in 911 world, you know, you know, once you've activated the system, you're in. Um, are we gonna be deciding that as well? Uh, how we so, handle so that? I, I think your question, I, I absolutely understand your question, and there's two directions to the conversation. If the call is originating 911, we already know your location, but that caller may not want the 988 center to know it. We can use it for routing and not disclose it in that direction. That's possible. Um, and, and the technology supports the ability to do that. Vice versa, we can do the same, but you absent if if the if the counselor is determining the location of the caller well they've got to tell them and so at that point the counselor knows and we can use it for routing and when you go into 911 that location needs to be known because obviously you've got to dispatch services so you've got to get through that challenge coming the other direction if i push a link to the 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 help seeker and they respond to that link, it's possible to not disclose that to the counselor. But we do have to dis disclose that to 911 because we need to know where they are in order to send services. So I think it's those kinds of conversations from a policy perspective that are going to be very interesting. The technology supports either. So, and I think that's really a lot of what this group is going to have to do. And probably even make some recommendations on public messaging about what the system can and can't do and which system can do what. And I think that's probably going to be important as well. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And, and challenging. So I, yeah. I, I think I hear you volunteering for something. <laughs> I'm just going to keep that in the back of my body. <laughs> So I absolutely don't expect this to have happened yet, but one of the things we may want to consider <clears throat> as I think about this as a developmental process, um, I've been talking about a variety of different things in this space, in the behavioral health space that I think are going to take the decade of, of till 2030 to, to have the capacity to do. Um, we may want to think about prioritizing some of the laundry list of activities that we have as a, as a board. Um, I would say 
We also at Health and Human Services have heard very clearly from constituents that they want us to focus um, early on in our process around communications, uh, managing expectations. Um, uh, so we might want to think, um, I mean, because we're talking about technology, there may be a step-by-step -step process of things we have to do first, um, but that might be something for, for us to think about um, with that laundry list of things. I, I don't know technology-wise, obviously you need the vendor first, but you know, um, but <clears throat> maybe like a like a, a work plan. And then I forgot to ask this question. I know it's in the statute, but I don't recall. Does this technical advisory board exist forever? Do we sunset at a particular point? Um, it it does sunset. I I want to say it's twenty twenty eight. It it's it's out there. Away. It's like the end of the decade, kind of like yes, for us. Yes, I, okay. I I think it is. Um, we, I'd have to go look. Do you? I think it's twenty twenty eight. Okay, that's what I seem to recall. But it's not anytime soon. Yeah. But we will have good. that answer for you for sure by the next time we meet. But yeah, I want to say it's twenty twenty eight. Yeah. Okay. It is. I think yeah. that's right. Yeah, it's twenty twenty eight. So yeah, ten years. I think the thing or, to keep wait, in mind like, no, in some six. of these conversations <laughs> is that, yeah, we're all going to get to know each other into our old age. Um, <laughs> um, but I think we're going to have um, potentially um, more entities that want to become 988 call centers. Like, mm -hmm. I think we're going to have new people who come into the mix. Um, uh, so I just think we just have to build... Um, I, we, it is the holiday season, but like build something that we can add more ornaments to. And we and I have talked about this. Um, as long as it's a platform that we can add more ornaments to, including new partners, um, new centers, potentially new designated centers, et cetera. Yeah. One thing we've done when we wrote the requirements, we we base everything on a, on a set of numbers so that it's an apples to apples comparison in terms of costs. So we can select competitively select a vendor. But once we do that, that cost they've agreed to is in place if only one center selects them or if it's 50. If we grow past the 13, the same cost workbook applies. So we have that mechanism built into the contract, which is good. Now the process of how we recognize additional centers and all of that, that would, that would be something up for discussion, but the contract itself would not need to be modified. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There it is. December 31st, 2028. I remembered that right. Wow. <laughs> and it's not 10 years. I think it's six years, but I'm an engineer, so I can't do math. Uh, okay. Any other comments or discussion on this? Um, Budge, uh, this is Matt Goldman online. Um, I do have one final question. Um, implied here, I think, is that not all 988 calls are going to get transferred to 911 and not all 911 calls are going to get transferred to 988. Uh, this is the technical piece of how those calls that do need to be transferred will be transferred. But where does the conversation happen around triaging and clinical decision making and which calls should be transferred between one or the other? So there is um, a portion of our charter as a board that addresses that. And that's a, that's a separate conversation. So um, we want to make sure the technology can facilitate it. Otherwise, we could have the discussion and say, you've got to do it. And then the technology is not ready to do it. So um, we've started with, as you pointed out, the technology has to support that. Okay, now what's the underlying policies that, are, uh, that need to be in place or procedures to make that determination? That's a pending activity. And I think in general, what we've seen is there's certain minimum requirements that are put in place. State of Virginia has done this. State of Minnesota has done this. And there's certain minimum things you've got to address. And then locally, there may be additional things that are important to you because of the diversity and capacity you have at the local level. So it's probably that framework that we will begin with and we've got some expertise on the board of some folks who are actually doing this where they can bring that in too. So we set a policy at the state level that's sort of minimum that 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 doesn't is not overly exclusive, but yet is succinct enough to make sure that the right services are being provided. And then locally, there may be something different depending on the exact needs that you have. Probably the biggest case and point 
today is not everybody has a mobile crisis team. So that, that would be completely change how you do things operationally if you're providing that service or if you're not providing that service. That's probably a, a big differentiator. And there's going to be others. So at, at this point, that's about as much as we could say. But one of the things this group is going to have to do is, you know, this technology will be ready in the middle of 2023 at a few centers. So prior to then, it would be good to have some kind of baseline documents out on, on that process is what we're thinking. And so that's a future work item that we've got in front of us. Thank you. But I have a question just to follow up on um, the previous question is, just so I understand the expectations is our sole focus is the technical piece and making sure we're integrated 988-911. But is this board going to be responsible for creating operational policies um, for 911 and 988 on that? Back to the, I'm not sure who asked that question, but Back to the question about triaging. Are we making that determination here at this board? So if you look on this graphic and it's slide six of the deck, from the statute, this board is supposed to be advising Cal OES on standards and protocols, that third bullet there in the middle of, of the slide, for 988 center call transfers to 911 and vice versa. So yes, we are going to be looking for some input. Um, probably what would what will work best is if we get some of your thoughts we put something together we present it back we see how close it comes to what it is that you all want you go back to the agencies and organizations you represent you bring back feedback we revise the document and then we get to something that we can all agree on and vote on that's how that will work and i would say that by the next time we meet in february we should probably begin to gather that data and information because it'll take us two board cycles to get through the approval and the technology could be ready to go as July, August timeframe. So that's kind of a, a, a high level overview of how we see this happening. Is that, does that answer your question? It does. Sorry, it does. Would it be feasible or something for us to discuss is when we get to that point of creating that protocol or vetting it is to create that subcommittee to help with that? Yes, absolutely. I think that's a great idea to, to form a subgroup on this and that way they can meet and deliberate multiple times in between each board meeting and then bring back some actionable things. So Erica, you had a comment as well. Um, yes. So I understand that, you know, Cal OES is now taking over the state lead uh, in Didi Hirsch's contract that you know, sunsets earlier, we do have an item that encourages yeah. that topic yeah. specifically. Yeah. In addition, uh, the 13 centers do collaborate on a monthly basis virtually. We're having an in-person meeting and some of these items that are now under purview of the board might be on the agenda. And there are three of us who will be there. So uh, maybe this is a further clarification, how can the 988 centers coordinate and collaborate without, you know, the board members here kind of running afoul of the, you know, public requirements? Yeah, so I think the specific question is, Meg, some of these items the centers are already talking about, there's a meeting coming up next week. A majority of the board members will not be there. I think there's only about three of us, maybe. So if we talk about these kind of items, are we going afoul of Bagley Keene? <laughs> I think you're going to be okay because it's the the serial meeting is majority of the board members. So like I said, because this is such a, a large board, it's going to be hard to hit that serial meeting. That's why I talked about the email reply all. That's probably going to be more the context of it. So I think you're okay. And obviously, and obviously the, some of these overlap with the, you know, the call centers um, discussions. So that's completely relevant. I think you're going to be fine under Bagley Keen. I don't think it's going to constitute a serial meeting. Thank you. I'll be sure to consult with you if I have further great, questions. Great in question. Future situations. Great question. Yeah. I, I will uphold the constitution. I took the oath. <laughs> 
I would also have to say that I do think that one of our 14, I wish I would have um, brought my laptop. I apologize because I could look it up really quickly. I actually think as part of the five-year implementation plan that we're supposed to develop recommendations as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so it looks like this is conversation is going to be happening in several places. So it's glad that we kind of have, um, we have representation uh, in, in all of those areas of some of the same people. Um, I don't think it's going to be an issue for Bagley Keen, but I think in, in some ways it'll help us coordinate. Yeah, the collaboration between the two um, will be really helpful. So yeah, appreciate it. And the the object is not to restrict the conversation. So we certainly want to have those conversations. Um, just have to be careful. We all know who's on the board now. Just, just follow the rules and we'll be fine. So, all right. Okay, so I'm going to go back to the graphic and uh, I'll see if there's any comments from any other comments from the public on this. All right, go ahead, sir. Um, if you want to come to this mic right here so everybody can hear you. Is, is it green light on? Oh, there we go. There you go. Thanks. It was green. It just wasn't on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm Rob Bennett, a consultant for WorkVantage. Um, I noticed from the CHS, you've got the, tra the I3 transfers in and out from, um, from that into a 911 center. Well, as we know, the way calls are routed in the 988 system, I can take my 925 area code to Denver and make a call. And it will show up here, even though I might need support in Denver. Likewise, somebody from Denver could be visiting here, call 988, and also need service from here. So does the RFQ today support transfers outside of California, um, either in or out of the CHS? So there, yes, the, it uses the NINA registry. And so that will be integrated into the solution. So if the counselor on the 988 side gets a call and it's you and you're in Denver, but it came here because it's routed on area code, they would be able to see that. And then if you needed to be transferred to 911 in Denver, the NINA registry is used to route that call there. Now at that point, in most cases, it is going to be a 10 digit transfer because they don't have next gen 911, hmm. but we could get the call from the counselor to the center um, in, in that way. The same thing would exist if the call is landed in some other state, but it would be dependent on what that solution in that state looks like to get it back into California. But if it came back into California, we could deal with it there. So yes, those right. requirements are in the, the statement of work and the technical requirements. Great. And as a follow-up to that, are you foreseeing that your 911 ESI net network will have I3 connectivity to I3 networks in, say, Massachusetts, Florida? So one day, yes. Um, and that's a much larger conversation. Um, we, we certainly will be connected to Arizona, Nevada, and Oregon, our neighboring states. There is a plan and it references the forest guide and the standard to route a call anywhere within California. And we have the ability to support that, but other states are probably farther down the road before they get there. So yes, one day, what was the, the 10 year timeline Stephanie gave? <laughs> one time within the next 10 years, that will probably be available nationwide. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Seeing no other comments. I'm going to go on to the next um, briefing item. So this is one that's specifically called out in the statute. Admittedly, the bullets on this slide are focused on technology. We probably need another slide on policy. We've already had that conversation. I just wanted to put out there in writing where we are today and where we're headed. So obviously transfers today are done using the technology that exists today and local policies. Um, the, the, the solution we just described will provide a way to move that all the way to interoperable where we want it to be, but the next gap to solve will be the policies and procedures on that. And so those need to be updated based on the requirements that are in AB 98, are really the work of this board. So we know all of those things are related to this conversation, and hopefully we'll all kind of have a good sense of where we are today 
and where we need to go. We may have some differing opinions of how we get there and what that looks like, but that's really what this is all about. So um, we'll continue to, to kind of flush this data out as we move forward as a board. So any other comments or questions on that from the board? All right, from the public or anybody online? All right, the surcharge, okay. So much of the data you're gonna see on the next couple of slides is public data from the 9 advisory board. And so it's already been shared out in the, in the public space. So this is the process that exists today for SETNA, which is the State Emergency Telephone Number Account, if you wanna know what the acronym SETNA stands for. And what the statute did is it took the revenue and tax code that was in place for 911 and it just added 988 to it. The reason to add 988 to that statute is because the FCC has very strict requirements on 911 fee utilization that we have to stay in compliance with or we'll be what's called a fee diverting state, which is not something we aspire to be. So we have to be able to keep 911 separate from 988. So they borrowed the structure of SETNA and the funding mechanism of SETNA and added 988 to it. That's what the legislation did. So the legislation also set the surcharge in the first two calendar years. And this is where it's gonna get a little fuzzy. We operate on a fiscal year, starts in July, ends in June. But the fee is a calendar year. So there's always kind of a mismatch in the fee you're collecting versus what you're authorized to do in the budget. And that's what we have to, to kind of work through on our side. And we do. Thankfully, the fees stay fairly stable and that doesn't become a problem. So the fee for calendar year 2023 and 2024 is set at eight cents. The way that you are able to use that fee as a state agency, it has to be in the budget. The legislation started collecting the fee as of 2023, but none of the state agencies have a budget to get access to that funding until the budget is approved in July of 2023. So the fee will be collected and deposited in, in the fund, no risk of it not being used for what it's not supposed to. And then in July of 2023, based on the budgets that are approved through the legislative process, the state agencies, specifically our, our two agencies, really, Health and Human Services and Cal OES, will have approved budgets to be able to use that fee. So that's the process and how it works. So the legislature approves the budget. Once the budget's approved, now we know the revenue that needs to be generated in order to meet the budget requirements. We gather the access lines, and the access lines are reported to us by all the carriers. So this is your cell phone, your voice over IP phone at home, your landline phone that grandma still has. And, you know, it's all those, you add all those numbers together and you just do the math. This is the revenue you're authorized. This is how many access lines there are. And you do the math and then you set the surcharge to generate the revenue to support the budget based on the number of access lines. So that's the process. And we don't have to start this process until 2024, because it's already set for us the first two years. So what do the numbers look like? I used a budget amount of 44 uh, million because eight cents generates about that much revenue. I mean, the numbers are known, these are all public numbers. The number of access lines are reported to us by the carriers, this is a known number. And these are the numbers that we use for 911. It was briefed out at the last 911 advisory board meeting, if, if you want to go online and look at it. So let's just say, for example, our budget was 44 million. Then we would do the math and say, okay, there's 46 million access lines. You do the math and the little formulas down there. Basically, if you take the number of access lines times the surcharge times 12, that's the annual revenue you're bringing in. Now it's projected because the number of access lines change. People get more cell phones all the time, new lines are added and all that. So for the first couple of years, this is roughly the revenue coming into the fund. 
we can't say anything more about authorized expenditures or whatever, because that's all a legislative process that we don't control. And it's happening right now. But when the budget is passed or in January, when it's first put out, you'll get the first sense of what this is at the same time that we do. So, cause it'll, it's a public document. So that's kind of the process. And we'll just let you know how this is moving forward. I think for this board, probably the biggest thing to consider is the role that, that you have is you making recommendations to Cal OES based on the needs of the organizations you represent on the projects that need to be done. Because those projects can't get done unless they have revenue. And that, so you know, you you think, oh, I've got a great idea. If you follow the timeline, your great idea will be implemented about 18 months later. Because that's how long it takes to get the budget approved, to get the fee changed, to get the revenue coming in, to get that in place. So it's possible. And we we've been very successful. We've we've got the best 911 system in the United States is here in California because of this process. So as clunky as this sounds, it actually works. So that's the fee. And as much as we can say about it today and the process. So any questions on that? Go ahead, Tracy. Um, does it have a different line item? You know, like, so it's gonna be 911 set none, 988 yes. set none? Yes, okay. the, the 911 <laughs> fee is a separate part of the revenue and tax code, and it can go from anywhere from zero to 80 cents. Yeah. Separate. This one is a separate, and it can go from zero to 30 cents. And then that range that it's in gets set based on the budget approved. So if the budget approved comes in and says, hey, we need $100 million, not $44 million, then you just do the math and say, okay, $100 million is, I don't know, 12 cents. And so then we would submit the fee to be 12 cents based on the number of access lines. Okay. Yep. I just want to make sure it all looks different. So there's no, you know, completely let's take from different, <laughs> completely separate, tracked separate. And uh, it all comes into the Department of um, Fee and Tax, CD, CDTFA, Department of Fee and Tax Administration is the one who collects the fee and then they deposit it into the fund and then that's how it works. Yep. Okay. So probably more than you ever wanted to know about the budget process in the state of California, but there you go. That you, that's how it works. All right, any other questions from the board on this? Okay, any questions online or from the public on that? Okay, perfect. All right, so statewide contract update, um, really other than the, the 98 call handling solution and and CRM solution, no other contracts are, are in process right now. So not really much to update on this item. And that's it for the, for the state update. Um, and and we're, we're coming close to time. So I think we're doing well. So as promised, the next agenda item is future meeting dates and agenda items for those meetings. So I heard some earlier but I'm gonna solicit the board um, for agenda items for future meetings. And if you forgot what you said earlier, I, I have it written down because, go ahead, Rosa. Budge, are we able to have a standing agenda item for an update from the 9 and 8 advisory board? Yes, I think that's what Stephanie was alluding to. That, yeah. that would yes, be... I, offer, I offer that up. So we will, we can start doing that in February. Okay. I'm not, I can't guarantee that the advisory board will have met yet, but we can certainly, I can do something very similar to today's meeting. So I wrote a note to myself saying the crosswalk about where there are some overlapping responsibilities is an activity that I need to do. Um, so we can work on that too. Maybe that kind of analysis, I think might be a good thing for us to present to the group. And of course, whenever we do those kinds of analysis, there's probably some gray areas. Okay. So we will add that as an, a standing agenda item. Yeah. We'll put you toward the end so you can, you'll have time to warm up to get to that one. <laughs> okay, Jeff. Uh, Budge, um, since we have some uh, hard deadline milestones that we have to meet, maybe something that, how, how we're going to measure that, what process we're going to go mm -hmm. through to measure that. So we are are discussing those points that are necessary to make sure that we are meeting those, those deadlines. Um, 
at least in a timely manner without having to, to rush to those. Right. And, and I would need a reminder on what those did because they were they were fairly broad, like uh, confirming interoperability, those kind of things. But I think I think I think we as a group are going to have to decide, well, what does that mean? What how are we going to define what interoperability means and, and meeting those milestones? OK, so kind of like a, a slide on milestone requirements for the board mm -hmm. and then updated status. And when we get to that agenda item on where we are in terms of those milestones, that's what you're thinking. Yes. OK. All right. Okay. Others. I might have written something else down. So there was an ask on a report out of interaction with FCC, Samsung, Vibrant. Is that something we would? Okay. So we'll add that. Um, in the interaction with FCC, SAMHSA. And vibrant. Any other organizations that you can think of that should be in that list that we should be regularly interacting with? Okay, if you have an aha moment, it's okay. You can let us know later, but we'll we'll kind of keep that one in there. Okay, and then. I think that was all I had heard throughout the discussion. There was something on communication and outreach as well. You know, I think it just goes back to just a basic work plan. I think, um, and yes. the gentleman at the yeah. end, I do not recall your name. I apologize. Um, but I think that's what you were kind of getting at. Um, yep. Just kind of, I think that would just be part of that presentation. Um, okay. And I, I don't recall, and, and I think Rose brought it up earlier about um, the procedures, the, those discussions. Um, it might be good to have a, did we already talk about that, having a, that as a standing item? So I think Rosa was mentioning that we should have a, a working group, a subcommittee form, which we can do. Actually, I don't know if we could do it today because it's not on the agenda, but we could put it on the agenda for next time. So we'll put that as an agenda item for next time that that we talk about forming that working group. And so when we have that discussion, uh, we, would, we would put it on the agenda, which means we can vote on it. Right. So meaning in February, come ready to vote, not just talk. Otherwise, it's fine. We can talk. We'd have to push the vote to the next meeting, then vote on it and implement it, which is fine. I mean, if those are going to be things like that, that we do on this board, which which is okay. We just need to know that it takes waiting to the next board to have that vote. Okay, which is fine. I'll add that on Thank an you. agenda for a, a working group discussion. And we'll probably make it um, uh, generic so that we can discuss what those working groups might be. Right, and then, Budge, I did want to point out that the statute says the board shall meet no less than quarterly. So if we feel that we need to meet more than that, there's nothing prohibiting that if we need a board meeting sooner or in between these quarterly board meetings. Hi, guys. You want to set these up more often? <laughs> Thank you, Meg. I, I appreciate that. Yeah. So we can actually meet more frequent than that. Um, I think between now and February, you know, with the holidays and everything, that's probably a good meeting cycle. But that would be something to think about as well coming into the February meeting if, if an, another meeting is needed prior to the May one that you see here. And um, not an agenda item, but a related question. So I'm sure you'll inform us of the process to, I don't know, put to a vote of additional meetings. Um, but if agenda items that we're interested in presenting towards the board for the next meeting come up in the interim, like it would be good to know if there's an established process for how we can present those and ask that so we don't have to wait six months before. <laughs> Yeah, so um, great question. So the process would be um, you could you could reach out with a request for a special meeting. The challenges we have is we have to post the agenda 10 calendar days prior to the meeting, and we have to make sure that a majority of the board members can be there. Otherwise, we have the meeting. We don't have a quorum. You can't vote on anything anyways. So those two things are really the only 
challenge and then we just have to put out the meeting notes and everything so meg i don't know if you want to comment on that yes and i apologize during my Pag bagley keen presentation i didn't talk about special meetings but there is an opportunity to do special meetings where a 10-day notice would be a hardship and for special meetings you just have to have 48 hours notice but there has to be some sense of urgency or emergency um, but we certainly are able to do special meetings too that's a 48 hours and if we follow the regular process, just logistically, it takes us about 30 days to pull one of these off by the time we generate the agenda, make sure it complies with all the rules, get it vetted, approved, and posted. So really, you know, that that's moving pretty quick for us, but we can do that. And we have done that on the 9-1 advisory board where we held a special meeting in between sessions. So we can certainly do that. Thank you. And then I think just to clarify my question uh, further, right now we're discussing ad agenda items we would like on the February 16th meeting. If between now and February 16th, we'd like to maybe add, is there is there a way to add items to the agenda before the meeting and yeah. what is that just process? Send, it, send a note to Carrie. You want to wave your hand back there? She's the one who coordinated with you to get here today. And let her know that you want an agenda item added and we can add it. That's no problem. Again, that 10 day posting. So really, if you think about the middle of, of January, that that would be, you know, for our process about the deadline to do that because of how long it takes us to get it approved and posted and vet all that kind of stuff. But yes, we can certainly accommodate that. Okay. Along the same line, um, just as Edwin. Um, will the draft agenda be circulated with the board prior to the finalization so that it's just kind of in a similar vein, you know, just do, does it, is it a typical process or, or not necessarily? So yes, it will. And we can. <laughs> just beware the reply all. That's one of those emails that will come out and we just don't, you know, just reply to the person who sent it. Don't hit reply all because we just don't want to run afoul. What, what you'll typically see in communication from Carrie is you're in a BCC. When you're down in the BCC column, you can't reply all. So if, if you get that email, that's why we do it that way. Um, it'll be an email like to Carrie, from Carrie to Carrie. And then all of you guys are in the BCC. So when somebody mistakenly hits reply all, not that that would happen. We don't start a serial meeting and get a call from Meg. <laughs> Yeah, so absolutely, if you have a meet, uh, uh, items for the next agenda that you think of after today, let us know. Please let us know by about the middle of January so we can get them into our process. And then we'll circulate the draft agenda around um, as we generate that. Okay. All right. Any comments online for agenda items for future meeting? Nothing? Okay. All right, so now we're at the point where um, we'll solicit public comment. So first we'll go to the board. Is there anything the board want to talk about that was not on the agenda? All right, any comments from the public? All right, seeing and hearing none. Everyone's favorite, adjourn. So do we have a motion to adjourn? Rosa will motion to approve. All right, Rosa has a motion. Do I hear a second? Erica Aragon seconds. Erica seconds. All right. Do I have to take a roll call on this? No. All right. So we are adjourned. Thank you. We appreciate that. Mm -hmm. <coughs>